as everybody is, and I'll mention this again later as everybody uh, gets in and, and gets settled, um, there are CEUs available for this. Um, so if you would like to, uh, at, the, at the end of our, of our um, event, if you want to email me um, at rev.hank.jenkins, and I will put that in the chat. Um, and if you would like to gain CEU credit for uh, participating in this event, it is um, 0.7 CEU credits that you can gain. I'm very excited. We have people joining us from across, across the U.S., uh, Many that I know, many that I do not know, uh, but I'm glad that you are all joining us tonight. In all, we've had uh, 39 or 40 individuals sign up for this event. Um, not everyone will be able to join us tonight. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking we will have about 30 individuals join us tonight. Um, maybe a little bit less than that. Well, let's go ahead and get started. And Jonathan, if you don't mind, if you will pay attention to sure. um, the participants list and admit people as they come in, yep. uh, if I don't see them. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Hank Jenkins. I am co-chair of the Association of Ministers with Disabilities, uh, and welcome to our 2021, 2021, it, still, it feels so weird to say that, our 2021 annual conference for the Association of Ministers with Disabilities. Um, our title this year, our theme this year is Prophesying to Power the intersections of ableism and racism. Um, over this past summer, as, uh, as much of the, the uh, uh, racial unrest was taking place in different places, uh, AMD made a commitment that we were going to uh, start addressing issues of race within, uh, within our organization, but also with uh, within the stuff that, uh, that we produce and we talk about. And so we thought it was appropriate that the theme for our conference this year would uh, be about how um, race and disability intersect. Um, and uh, and, and that's, a, that's a rather important, uh, important issue, um, especially around uh, what I think a lot of people don't realize is during um, uh, some of the protests and, and often when individuals, um, what we have known is that majority of individuals who um, have come up against um, police brutality that uh, while a number of them are African-American, a number, number of them are also people with disabilities. Um, uh, and that is something that goes underreported, uh, but is a reality. Um, so we are excited to get this, uh, this event started. Um, if you will look in the chat, you will notice that we have two ASL interpreters for this evening's chat. Um, one of them is Helen Chang, and the other is Becky Fry. Her video is turned off at the moment. Uh, but if you need ASL interpretation, please make sure to pin their, their videos at the top of your, of your screen so that you can see them. We also have this uh, event being captioned. Um, you will need to turn on your closed captioning at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and if you do that, the closed captioning will, uh, will pop up for you. Uh, so once again, I just want to say welcome. Um, I'm glad you are all here and that you are all joining us. I'm going to ask Jonathan to open us with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over. Uh, well, then I'm going to introduce our first uh, speaker. Uh, Jonathan, will you open us in a word of prayer? Sure. It's an honor to be with all of you. Let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together 
and to reflect on how the church can be prophetic to power, especially around racial discrimination and ableism. We pray that you will open up our lines of thought and communication and our hearts and minds to one another so that we can grow toward each other, learn from each other, and most importantly, honor you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I, real quick, uh, before we do, we're going to, our first speaker for tonight is going to be Latia Frazier. Um, she is going to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have a short Q&A, and then we will break off into small groups and have some time to uh, uh, digest and talk about what we have learned, and then afterwards we will come back in a large gathering. Um, but first, let me introduce you to Latia Frazier. I had uh, the wonderful opportunity uh, of meeting Latia probably about five or six years ago uh, when I was living in Columbia, Missouri. Um, Latia is a minister out of the Nazarene faith, um, and she's also an individual that, uh, that has cerebral palsy, uh, other nine, otherwise known as CP. Um, she is a New York City native that now lives in Kansas City. Uh, as I said, she's an ordained pastor with the Church of the Nazarene. She's an activist and an organizer connected with the Kansas Poor People's Campaign. And, um, and she's, a, or, I'm, I'm not saying that right, Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Uh, she's a disability rights advocate, and she's a hospital chaplain and a doctoral student. Uh, she does a lot. Reverend, Reverend Latia received her Bachelor of Science in Adolescent Education in English from Nyack College in New York. She received her Master's of Divinity from Nazarene Theological Seminary in Kansas City and she is also currently completing her doctorate of ministry degree at the Nazarene Theological Seminary. Uh, with that, her, and for her demon, her focus is on spiritual formation and disability theology. She enjoys traveling and participating in new adventures. She is passionate about the intersection of faith, race, and disability, and she identifies as a proud African American uh, and becoming Christian woman who lives with a physical disability. Uh, she's a daughter, sibling, friend, and a new plant mom, and who wants to be a writer, teacher, and preacher, and professor when she grows up. Uh, I'm very excited uh, now to have Latia present to us. Latia, take it over. All right. Hi, so glad to be um, with all of you. I will be sharing slides. Um, there aren't any pictures on them other than the theme of the you know, the, the theme that comes with the, the slides. So just so that we know that. And I would invite, um, I'm gonna invite um, some conversation. So feel free to unmute when that happens. If you have any comments or questions, also feel free to put it in the chat um, if that's more comfortable for you. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. All right. I'm going to move the tile so I can see. Um, okay. okay, so as a way of introduction, I know that Hank has already um, given it a little bit of an introduction. Uh, and some of this is obvious, but I just need to say that up front that I come at this um, with many different identities, but the three that I will name tonight is that um, I am an African-American woman who, who knows that those who've come before, before me and who've struggled um, uh, to achieve liberation are with me now. Um, Maya Angelou uh, always said that uh, she and we are um, the dream and the hope of the slave. So knowing that that is part of my history, but not the only thing, right? So um, that we 
as African Americans have achieved and have achievements, and we have the story of being enslaved. Um, I also come as a person who identifies as a woman, and I carry um, the feminine energy, right? That that allows me to connect with the feminine uh, aspect of God. Um, and then I'm a person who identifies with a physical disability. I'm reading a book called My Body is Not an Apology as part of my, my doctoral studies. And it, it's always this um, trifold thing for me. Like I cannot separate being African-American uh, being a woman and being a person with a disability. So when I go into a space and I'm I'm sensing and experiencing stigma or some kind of discrimination, I I I can't do the like, are people not comfortable because I'm an African American, a woman, or um, somebody with a disability? So it all comes together um, for me. Okay. I would also like to open us up in prayer. Um, this is an adapted version of the prayer attributed to St. Francis. So let us pray. God, make us instruments of your justice. Where there is false and untenable peace, let us sow dissent. Where there is injustice, fury. Where there is oppression, hope. Where there is false fluorescence, profound darkness. Where there is social depression, life. Where there is crime and poverty, a sustainable economic infrastructure. Grant that we may not so much seek to be uplifted as to uplift, to be seen as to see others. For it is in protesting the sin of the system that we can more fully acknowledge our own sin. It is in demanding justice of the powerful that we live out God's demands for us. And it is in rejecting the American dream that we are born into God's dream. Amen. So I was having a conversation earlier this week about, uh, I'll move this over again. We're doing the, moving the tile thing over. Um, I was having a conversation earlier this week with some friends who were missionary kids. So they were born in the US but spent most of their life in different countries because their parents were missionaries. Um, I know a lot of people who had that same experience as military kids or as people who are adopted, right? This third culture. But then as we began to continue that conversation, um, what struck me was that um, many of, and again, this is just my perspective, right? So I feel like I need to say that um, I don't speak for a whole people group, right? But it's my perspective um, that the African-American experience is felt in the US has felt like uh, a third culture that, that you don't really fit here and you don't really fit there. That, that I'm not really African, right? Like I don't have all the African culture and things, but yet I know that my ancestors are from there and I'm not really American in the sense that, yes, I was born here, but I don't fit the, the white supremacist structure of what it means to be American. I am in more ways than one, not the ideal um, of what an American, at least what is esteemed, right? What we see. Um, so finding myself as a third culture person in my own culture, in my own, uh, the country of my origin. Okay, and I'll read this. Um, this is from uh, Debbie Kramer's book. Um, and I, I found it as a good way to encapitalize like everything I'm trying to communicate in terms of 
managing all of my identities. So she says, throughout much of history, people with disabilities have been oppressed and repressed as individuals and as a social group. People with disabilities have been isolated, incarcerated, institutionalized and controlled without entering into any sort of oppression derby over which minority group has been the most oppressed in history. It is important to note that people with disabilities, especially those who experience double or triple oppression based on other categories of gender, race, class, and so on, have experienced some of the worst that history has to offer. So again, being okay in my body, in all that uh, my identities represent and knowing that um, God has called me and God has called each of us to be in the work of liberation. So, so this is what I assert tonight that advocacy, because we're talking about advocacy tonight, um, is, is connected to spiritual formation, right? To be able to speak up for yourself and with and on behalf of others is spiritual formation. To know who you are and to know who other people are as image bearers of God and therefore um, in the struggle of liberation together. The, um, that my liberation is wrapped up in your liberation, that people's with disabilities liberation is wrapped up in um, BIPOC people's liberation, is wrapped up in white folks' liberation because we all are swimming in this white supremacy culture. And just um, so that we're clear, BIPOC is black indigenous people of color, um, as I will continue to use that term. So here, I'm, I will invite conversation. Um, and because I can only see a few of you as I'm sharing the screen, if you want to speak out using your voice, please just unmute and do that. If you want to do um, in the chat, then, then I know that somebody will read it out for me. So I'll give a few minutes, but how can, how can uh, we shape the whole church to be a people and place of liberation for people with disabilities and BIPOC folks. So just like some free thinking, some thoughts you've had, some experiences. So how can we shape the church to be a place of liberation for both people with disabilities and BIPOC folks? And I'll give a few seconds. Don't be shy. Uh, this is Lindsay. Um, uh, one thing that I think of is uh, what, what feels spiritually to me like an idolatry of buildings and uh, be, you know, even, even in COVID era when I personally have had a lot more access um, because I didn't have to deal with church buildings, uh, which I, and I haven't met one that works yet uh, for me. Um, the, the addiction to buildings being church instead of, I don't know, a scriptural interpretation of uh, what church is, uh, which would be humans, um, it, it, you know, is, is my reading, um, is I, I, I find over and over um, you know, that in even, uh, I'm, I'm very attuned to and supportive of, uh, of lament at church, but I, um, I also notice that I feel a little bit killed every time somebody says, I can't wait to see y'all again, or I can't wait till we get back to normal or um, things that I haven't been able to do um, in several years. And um, 
it, because that again indicates that I that I ever had access to the building in the first place, that I ever had access to that community in the first place, and the and the back to normal indicates something that's um, that's just not my reality. Um, and and I don't I don't want anything to get back to normal. I don't I don't I don't want to go back to um, times when uh, people were even even more oppressed. Um, if if there is a difference and it's so hard to tell from day to day whether that's true and uh, and i don't want to go back to a time where i don't have any church community and and COVID is the only reason i have any church community so that that's some initial thoughts i have yeah thanks so much lindsay for sharing um that's definitely been um true of a lot of people um that i'm in relationship with as well which is has me thinking about what an, an, an online intentional community looks like, but I can talk more about that later. Um, but if, if I just don't want to keep moving if there's anything in the chat or if anybody else wants to chat, but don't uh, feel like you have to. Yeah, Sharon in the chat said, one piece of this is creating the ability to see Christ and the holy in every person. That's right, right? Thanks for sharing. I'm going to move on, but we will continue um, conversation. So one way that I am kind of experimenting with, right? I don't know that I've landed on it as a for sure thing, but I think one way that we can teach and uh, spiritually shape in terms of advocacy in the church is using the liturgical year as our guide. And so I'm going to go through um, each of the seasons of the church and then offer some thoughts and then we can obviously have some discussion. So we uh, just recently finished Advent and we know that Advent is waiting in anticipation. Now the traditional story is that we are, are waiting for the, the liberator, Jesus, to come, right? And uh, people in Jesus's time were looking for someone to bring liberation physically in that moment and not necessarily were very spiritually minded in the sense that um, the American church has separated um, our spiritual life with our physical everyday stuff, which I would assert that we shouldn't do that because that's not true. But another way to think about um, Advent is what is it that we are waiting for and anticipating, right? So as an African-American or a BIPOC person, one way that we can name it is that we're waiting for the end of white supremacy, waiting for the end of racism and decentering whiteness as the norm or the standard by which every other culture has to do something. We're waiting for the end of patriarchy and sexism and misogyny. We're waiting uh, for the end of ableism, right? So that if we encapsulate waiting and uh, connecting each other's liberation, people with disabilities don't become the special group by which uh, you know, special programs or things need to happen or uh, we get ignored, right? So if we see ourselves as connected and in, in working toward our own liberation, then, then as we work to name the things we're waiting for, it's gonna hit or it should hit many of the ways people experience oppression. Um, which would include um, ableism. So the next one, we just finished this one, would be Christmas. And in this way, humanity and divinity, right, come together, they mesh. Um, the, the Jesus, the liberator, takes on human, the human experience. And we, we over-spiritualize that, which that's so important. I'm not trying, I'm an I'm a ordained pastor, so I gotta be careful. But also like 
the human experience encapsulates the fact that Jesus's parents, at least his mom was a teenager. And although that, that was culturally acceptable, it's still very young in, in the lifespan. I can't, you know, just knowing me and how I was, it took me a little bit longer to mature as a person. So I know that as uh, to have a child um, when you were a teenager, like hats off to those who have. Um, the, the experience of being refugees, okay? So they had to leave uh, in fear of their lives. So if we think about these different uh, ways in which God takes on human the human experience, not just this um, manger scene of the little baby in the, in the manger, right? Jesus takes on homelessness um, and having to find solidarity housing as, as he's moving about and doing the work of liberation. Um, the lack of access to adequate health care, right? There was for people with disabilities, because they had a disability, they lacked access to much of society. So while uh, I think the physical healing was really a secondary thing and it was, was really more so that people could have access to the social and religious life. Um, Jesus experienced religious oppression, um, death and disability. So this humanity and div divinity that God took on all parts of what it means to be, uh, to experience the human uh, experience. So uh, another question, in what ways can we advocate for the humanity of every person and honor the divinity in every person? Again, you can respond out loud or in the chat, whatever is most comfortable to you. May I may I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, can you tell me who you are? So I know my, who I'm my, name, my name is John Dahl. All right. Hi, John. I'm in southern New Jersey. All right. Um, I I think I may have some thoughts on how I might answer this, but how would you say that Jesus took on the experience of disability? Yeah. Uh, so I would point to um, the resurrected Jesus. I would point to the crucifixion, yeah. uh, the crucifixion as the disabling act. Um, so those are two right off my head that I would point to. Mm -hmm. And he was obviously he showed his scars. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. Mm -hmm. Any others either out loud or in the chat? Latino. Oh, go ahead. Go Jeff. ahead. <laughs> okay, I think, um, and there are others on this call that have um, helped me come to this, and I do this fully knowing I'm an ordained pastor. So there are for me things that are essential about uh, Jesus the Christ, but. <clears throat> I, I think um, if we can, as people of faith and as the church, we need to do our best to try to back away from our monopoly on God um, and admit that there is a whole lot about God we don't know. That's right. And, and um, may I love having conversations where my brain is taken to new um, planes of considering uh, things about God that maybe initially I'm not comfortable with or I'm not used to, but um, I think God is so much bigger than the church and as important as orthodoxy is to me in certain aspects of my calling um, so much bigger than even parts of our orthodoxy. Uh, 
said with a great deal of fear and trembling, of course. Yes, thank you. Was there someone else that would? Uh, yes. I wanted to point out that um, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, there's the account of the friends who brought the man who was uh, uh, on a stretcher and had to be lowered through the roof mm -hmm. of where Jesus was uh, uh, speaking. And uh, Jesus, uh, if I remember right, said, your faith has made you whole, get up your, take up your bed and walk. And uh, so w we see, go ahead. The different story. Oh, different story. Yeah. Excuse me, <laughs> I'm, I'm misquoting. I'm, I'm, a, un well, I'm a Unitarian. Uh, but, all the healing stories can uh, have a lot in common. Right, but, but the ultimate point was that uh, 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 the acquaintances and friends of the man brought him to Jesus and they did anything they could to bring uh, uh, healing to the man. And I've always thought that was uh, uh, a model, one model for the way we can be. Thanks so much for sharing. So in that particular story, uh, I see that as a shared liberation though, because Oftentimes, uh, if you've grown up around church circles, you hear that as, oh, the friends brought him to Jesus and, you know, because of their faith, he was healed. And I think really it was a shared thing because I don't know about you, but I, uh, there had to be consent along the way. I, I'm not, I'm not going to let somebody just pick me up and, and carry me anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then when, the, when the when the way to get into the synagogue or the person's house was not accessible to them to then bring me through the roof. So I think Jesus is, in that was responding to both the person with a disability and the, the people who brought him to, to Jesus. Um, and, and the friends, when they encountered the inaccessibility of the house, overcame it, did whatever they had to do so that their friend could see, could participate. And I think they are a model for us in their commitment to accessibility. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, if we, if we uh, bring out the story a little larger, again, that our liberation, so you may not be a BIPOC individual, but my liberation is wrapped up in yours and yours are in mine. So if we don't help each other, we will all continue to be oppressed, right? Um, even though in, in, in varying degrees. The next one is epiphany. So uh, we, we understand that uh, traditionally as the the astrologers or the wise men coming sometime after Jesus is born uh, to bear witness to it, to this birth and to bring gifts. But if we look at really what epiphany means, it's a moment of revelation, of insight and of truth telling. And we have a, a lot of that if we look at our culture just uh, a week ago, right? So, but if we look at uh, the COVID-19, there's, there's always been people who have lack of access to healthcare, um, that there are greater disparities um, for some than others. So COVID-19 has just revealed it um, to a greater degree and to more people. Um, it has revealed the fragility of our bodies, which I think people, many people with disabilities we're already aware of that, but it to a greater degree uh, reveals it to others who may not have been. Um, and that low wage workers are essential workers and that many of many, not all uh, low wage workers would also identify as BIPOC individuals. So uh, it's just revealing what has always been true specifically about um, 
our churches and our, our society. Um, and then the domestic terror attack that happened last week, it again, it revealed the racism, the power hoarding and the deep division that is already alive and well. And I think that before part of uh, talking about advocacy um, is first, you gotta tell the truth. What are the things that we need to advocate for and why we can't move as many people are just trying to move toward peace, then that's not real peace until we tell the truth about what's really going on. Um, and it, and it, it's just, it prevents gaslighting, right? And I, as people of faith, we, we um, often engage in confession. And so this is a way to say, we can acknowledge the white supremacist structures that are already, that are baked into the culture, that are baked into the church. Um, because, I mean, there are many churches that uh, if it was a different time, I wouldn't be even allowed to go. And that many denominations were not um, split on just because of different theological things like this church speaks in tongues and this one doesn't, but really the split was around race. Um, so. so what are some other things that are being revealed in terms of uh, liberation and things that need to be um, brought to light and uh, advocacy and people with disabilities? So again, you are invited to share either out loud or in the chat, you know. One, conver one conversation that's having um, going on in the chat between uh, Matthew and uh, Sharon that maybe you would like to address or talk about is the conversation around uh, that the ideals often put up as being normal, mm -hmm. but, but really the ideals should be about belonging and community. Right. So I don't know if you'd want to speak to that. Yeah, uh, I can't think. Uh, Tima Okun has a whole list of like white supremacy culture characteristics, those things that that are held up by the dominant culture as normal. Um, and yet really it's not normal, but it's just a different experience. Um, so I think about like speed is something that is held up as normal. If we can do it the most efficient way and um, which is not, always the best way, but really thinking about efficient and who, who, and then thinking about who can we pay the less amount of money to do the thing, right? So valuing profits over people, valuing, yeah. So a lot of different ways in which that comes out. Um, any other conversations going on in the chat or other ones? Or what are some um, other wait, things that are being revealed? Yeah. Just a conversation also around uh, the lines communities to, uh, decide to draw, um, the idea of the cultural construction of disability. Um, that also, the reality is that's also about race and gender and a lot of other things. But uh, that, that piece, I don't know if you want to speak to as well. Yeah. Um, and it's really, it's all, it's also could be about anti-blackness, right? Because even um, BIPOC folks who, who, who are lighter can, can navigate systems differently than someone like me who has darker skin. Same thing with people with disabilities in terms of the hierarchy of disabilities and what, how well you can navigate within the ableist system that is uh, our society, right? Um, so it's, it's trying to push us who can't do that toward the borderlands and, and advocacy, the hope of advocacy is that we decenter whiteness, that we decenter um, ableism and we say this is the human experience with many different varieties of how one experiences and navigates our world. Any other thoughts before we 
one. As you're talking about that, it makes me think of just these perimeters is maybe maybe the word that's kind of sticking with me. Um, you know, for example, having homeless shelters not be able to be populated until people have had um, COVID tests. And, you know, as a person who's, who's been homeless and not homeless and, uh, you know, on a lot, in a lot of sides of that hologram, I, and as a person who really, uh, really gets COVID easily, uh, I, I totally get the thinking behind that as a risk manager, I completely respect the, um, that thinking, but the perimeter of that thinking is such that it means the the natural immediate consequence is that uh, is that having COVID means you're out in the cold, and, and not having COVID means you're not. And um, the the danger there, human rights wise, is so um, is so massive and immediate. And and to think that even um, you know that the folks who have come up with that idea are are generally folks who do work in frontline and do, uh, you know, and, and are risk managing and, and dealing with a lot of things in their heads and are very savvy in some ways. But, but to think that that's, that's one space that, that folks haven't gotten to when they're making a decision like that. Um, when you were mentioning your prayer, when you're sharing your prayer earlier, um, you know, that idea of really paying attention to the structural um, sin so that I can go home and look at my own, you know, the, the, that's, that's such a useful, instructive tool, I think. And, and it just reminds me of those perimeters of, you know, where, where are my perimeters today? And what are the immediate effects on other people? Um, when, when those perimeters are in effect and what happens when I move those in, in an inch, out an inch, left an inch, right an inch. Yeah. So advocacy is always looking for, um, in whatever decision, is me who is it that i'm leaving out maybe intentionally or unintentionally and who is it that i'm calling in um are the people that i'm calling in uh people that think and look and uh navigate the world in the same ways that i do and the people are the people that i'm calling out uh, are they just in some way other so just to be that's an always moving target right like to keep thinking and be motivated. I think another thing that we have to be tell the truth about is that um, sometimes the disability community as a whole can be very white supremacist. So that we need to look at our structures uh, in uh, the different uh, disability communities we find ourselves in. Again, who's at the table and not just participating, but in leadership roles. Um, whose voices are we reading? As I'm reading a lot of disability theology, great stuff. Not many people would identify as BIPOC though. So just thinking through those things, um, who, who is it or who are the voices that are shaping our spiritual formation around issues of race and disability and other um, points of liberation? Yeah, and you have to be careful. Uh, well, it's important in that topic about who's speaking about disability. Often in disability circles, it's not even disabled folk who are talking about disability, right? And so you have to That's right. You have to be careful who are the voices and who's being lifted up because uh, there's a problem within disability of thinking disability folks have to be spoken for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, going back to that, you know, disability is so white topic, um, that is a problem within disability. And, and you know, we have uh, within disability community, we try to normalize what disability looks like. And that often, um, that goes with that hierarchy of disability. Somebody like myself, who is a white straight male, can pass in most instances because I'm uh, I'm a paraplegic and in most instances you wouldn't know that I'm I'm disabled so to speak but um, you know somebody who doesn't function like you want them to a, in a society gets gets the the short end of the stick so yeah um, sometimes the people that I leave out or unintentionally 
speaks to my own internalized ableism. That's right. So, yeah. I mean, I think we all have it, right? So the, the whoever that group of people are for us that we would name our own structural and systemic like ways in which we contribute to the problem and then and then and then work out our own liberation all right I, yeah go ahead i think what's what's also sad is because the fact that the the folks that usually speak about disability are folks who are white we give a really false impression because if we look not only in the country, but in the world, the majority of people who have disabilities are people of color. Mm -hmm. And so we're giving a false picture of what disability is in a lot of ways and who it affects. Yeah, and that somebody who's white, um, while you will also face, um, you know, stigma and discrimination. Um, another person that is a, a person of color is going to face both. Or if you're also a female or presenting as a female, like then you're going to have that. So it's just the whole web of stuff to, to work through. Uh, yeah. I'm going to go on to Lent. Okay. Matthew, yeah. when you said yeah. epiphany, I also thought about what happened in Washington, D.C. on epiphany. And oh, yeah, I did say that, I think. Did I not? Yeah. Well, so that was, it that it revealed the racism that's present and then also like the, the struggle <laughs> for hoarding of power. And, and and how that acts when it's really ticked off. Mm -hmm. yeah. And. I mean, the, the epiphany, the sudden realization is just going to keep showing itself. I haven't even been able to watch the news, but today I, I watched an account, read an account of actually what happened. And, you know, um, and the president was watching on TV, the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, Lord have mercy, uh, you know, but. I mean, and I don't want to get, you know, sidetracked tremendously, but um, a lot of good may come out of this because I think it revealed a lot of reality that people like me haven't seen. And I think while I want to hold the hope that you have, I also hope <laughs> I hold like uh, skepticism or sure. uh, Suspicion, sure. right? Sure, see, amen. Like, I want to see what actually happens first, right? Um, amen. Yeah. Well, and in such yeah. a visceral example, uh, like intersecting with with our topic and and last Wednesday, you know, just just watching someone preach and send people up a street and say, "I will be right there with you, walking with you," and then get in a car and not be walking with them, you know, just there, there's some to as a person who can't walk very often, I, that was that, that. I don't know what that was to me, but it was it was a deep thing. Help us, Lord. Yeah, yeah, and I, I I'm still struggling to process that because I, a few years ago, was at the that very same spot, and we were peacefully protesting, and we didn't even get close, right? Because yeah. we were met with like full on army right and we were all either people with disabilities or like not a threatening crowd at all and yet to see those two uh, yeah so yeah that's just a lot of things to still process do that but you see those intersections um okay so lent we are from the dust and will return to the dust and again i think this season can help in terms of advocacy um, because it it helps to all of us to remember that the, our vulnerability and our abilities, right? That our bodies are all vulnerable and uh, that we that they are strong, right? I think the pandemic has 
um, revealed that as well to some, like we are not, our bodies is not, are not as strong as like we try to present them to be. Um, and I think that disability theology has lots of good stuff that can be lent in that way. Um, and then creation care, which is so connected to that again, we are connected to not just people here, but people who have gone before us and the, the creation. Uh, scripture talks about how creation praises God. So we're all connected. Um, helps us to cultivate a relationship with Mother Earth and the feminine nature of God. So to think about, to take up uh, a handful of dirt, right? And know that like in some way, we're all a part of the same ecosystem. Um, and then a connection to our ancestors, the great cloud of witnesses, the freedom fighters and advocates of the past, right? That this helps us to think about those who have journeyed uh, before us uh, in terms of civil rights, in terms of disability rights, in terms of women's rights, all the things. And yet it's our turn to pick up the baton and keep going. And knowing that while I, I work for greater liberation, I, the next generation will have their own struggles that may look similar to ours. Um, so it's a continual um, journey to becoming more human, more liberated sorts of things. So um, any thoughts about that before we move on to the next one? So then the next is Holy Week and Easter. Um, and this is where, I mean, most of you, if you're into disability theology, ha have read The Disabled God by Nancy Eastman and, uh, and others who have expanded on that. But to think about Holy Week in terms of not just Jesus, and the disciples journeying through his last week um, on earth, but think about the various racial backgrounds and genders, all right? Um, receiving or sharing a meal together, that Eucharist is really solidarity. And by, by that is if our, um, the traditional painting of the Last Supper has the 12 disciples and Jesus, and I was really looking for a picture that displayed a more inclusive uh, view of that. And so I didn't find one, so I had it commissioned. And so I have that traditional um, picture of the Last Supper, but it has both people with disabilities and people without disabilities, people of varying genders and um, ethnicities present at the table. And I, I, I think of, again, the, the one that we see a lot is all typically white people with white Jesus um, experiencing the Last Supper. And to, to have art and songs and all the things we do to express our theology and reflect the expansiveness of the human experience also goes a long way toward um, advocacy um, because then it's not a, an exception, it's, it becomes part of the culture. Um, yeah, and then the Good Friday, those who are born with or acquire a disability can relate to this disabling experience, including Jesus. So it's one of the, the passages in which Jesus can can have that human experience of of, of disability, and then Easter, um, the disabled God lifts up the voices and experiences of people with disabilities uh, and people and BIPOC folk and women, um, as they are the ones to first proclaim um, good news. 
Um, and that when, G when Jesus has the encounter with Thomas, we see Jesus in the disabled body. And in that encounter, um, while Thomas often gets a bad rap for doubt, I think doubt is, is it's okay to uh, have present doubt and belief uh, make up our faith, right? So ways in which um, white supremacy culture says, you have to know the answer, you have to believe these things. Um, it opens up to say, I can have both faith and doubt and they can exist together. Any thoughts on that before we move to the next? Are there any conver uh, conversations going on in the chat? Um, uh, not specifically, but I, I'm always struck by the reality that the incarnation in and of itself is, is disabling. You know, if you take, uh, if you take Paul's stuff in uh, Philippians, where he talks about he, Christ emptying himself, then the very, the very incarnation from birth to death to resurrection is all um, disability for, for God. Um, and I think that's a powerful, for me at least, it's a powerful way to look at um, the incarnation in Jesus. So. I was Tom Reynolds, I'm sorry. Go ahead, William. Uh, Tom Reynolds, uh, theologian uh, in Toronto, Vanderbilt grad, uh, talks about uh, not about the disability inherent in that, but the vulnerability. And he says that we all share vulnerabilities, whether we admit to it or not. Uh, and that's helped me in understanding uh, the uh, uh, the passion, as it's known, and and uh, uh, vulnerability is, is a key issue for me. His uh, his uh, book is named "The Vulnerable Community." Uh, uh -huh. That's a good one. Was somebody else uh, going to speak? Thank you. I was just, this is Lisa McKee. I was just thinking that I want to sit with the idea of, of the Eucharist being solidarity because that really upsets some orthodoxy. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Do you want to say more about that? I, um, uh, like, I would love to see the picture that you had had commissioned, but I come from the Wesleyan tradition, and we really view um, communion as one of the, or Eucharist, as one of the means of grace. Now, whether we live that out, it's all another thing, and if I was thinking, what would it look like if all, all of a sudden we didn't stare at new people who came to church or who came to the table and were just open? And that's, yeah, and that's really not a good, I need to sit with it a bit, but. But, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, yeah. so I would also say uh, Nazarenes are Wesleyan. And so how I've come to that is that I see Eucharist is not only something um, as a sacrament, it can also be used as the saving grace, right? So that the, the very act of participating in Eucharist can... Um, be a point of revelation, right? So that if somebody who may not name Jesus or uh, be Christian um, may, through that experience of solidarity, uh, become Christian, right? So that uh, because you have, I 
ideally, right? If if we had the world as, as, as it should be, you have many different people coming to the table who may uh, be on different spectrums of belief on every other thing, but but that one act is is the act of solidarity, the thing that brings us together. And and I guess I kind of grabbed onto that because it allows me to claim and name that the sacraments and our meal sharing and our conversations are inherently subversive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not, not in a bad way, but a good way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But thanks for sharing. Any other thoughts before we move to the next thing? I, I think I wanted to share one thing and then just hear what anybody else thinks. So years ago in reading um, Nancy's work that Hank has noted there, um, but then also through conversation and now serving a church, I have tend, tended to, when I talk about our ability to understand Christ, you know, we have scripture, so we can look at that. But I was like, you realize that this side of the cross, the only Jesus we know has acquired disabilities. And so I love, I think it was William who said, you know, talking about um, Reynolds' work, where he, that, that canonic um, experience in Philippians. But when not, so as a pastor, whether I'm talking to my more typical and neurotypical or those in our congregation with disabilities. I'm like, you know, the only Jesus we know is post-resurrection. Mm -hmm. And the only Jesus post-resurrection, when you read scripture, it's not like it says, and suddenly he was magically healed of all wounds. You know, oh, instead sorry. it's, it's his hands had to, but you, you stab a knight or a, a nail through somebody's hand. Their hand is now palsied. You put nails through their feet, their, their gait is going to be different. And so we have tried to center the disabled Christ and having that be the norm around which everybody else has to go, oh, then what other places where, where I am not what would be considered typical in the world and how does that help me better relate to God? That's right, yeah. But I'd love to hear anybody else, I mean, I. That's just what I've done in, in my little church, but I would, I, I don't know that I've ever had a conversation about that beyond kind of our, our small community. Yeah, I think uh, that's one of the reasons why I wear, there's two reasons. So I grew up very uh, evangelical and uh, specifically like we wear crosses, we don't wear crucifixes, like this is the, the thing. Um, but I wear crucifix for two reasons. One is uh, to remember the disabled God, like that was the, the event in which Jesus became disabled. And it's also a way for me to, to connect with my culture to say that there are many um, brown skinned people who experience this same way of execution, right? So I like to remember both things. Yeah, I mean, it feels like it's a marrying of Nancy Iceland and James Cohn. Exactly. Ooh. But any other thoughts from anyone else? Um, Matthew in the chat brought up um, in Sean, uh, Sean Copeland's chapter on the Eucharist in Enfleshing Freedom. Uh, it says that it's about this topic as well. So that might be a resource for somebody. Yeah. Any others? I want to very quickly um, just make note before I have to hop off the call in a sec. Um, I think it's important to um, maybe reflect on the work of Canada Moss. Um, my wife does a lot of this and she's developing a uh, Christology of disability as part of her PhD. Um, and Canada Moss talks a lot about the story of the hemorrhaging woman and the language around that uh, indicates that Jesus is leaky and that the boundary between the woman 
Christ and the power flow is porous, so therefore uncontrolled, um, and in some sense, uh, without Christ's ability to be managed. So, and I, that's always been a good way for me to move conversations around the disabled Christ from a, a point of having to necessitate violence or fracture or brokenness. Not that the rest of that uh, language and imagery isn't very valuable, but um, it's just been another way in for me. Yeah, that's good. Any other thoughts before we go on? Okay. Um, I have a question about yeah. that, what Justin just mentioned. Justin, I, um, as I was taking notes, I realized that I was I was getting two different ideas um, from you, and I just wanted to see like which one was the one. Um, were you saying that? Um, I I think at the end you were saying that the the uncontrolled power, with sort sort of the 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 controlling agent opportunity would be to have. A Christ presence um, uh, in our lives is that? Did I hear you right, or or the the first idea I had was a little bit different than that? The first idea that I thought you were saying was was that just the the power in general is you know sort of the life force of you know in, yeah. in a variety of ways. Did I but I think those are two different interpretations. Could you clarify? Yeah. That? Real quick, and we'll, we'll we can follow up uh, off the uh, in a call with the two of us. But I was in that case. The idea of it is that the the power source from Christ is out of his control and somewhat leaky, so uh, he doesn't have the ability to. Uh, control where it goes or how it's experienced. Um, so that that's the main thrust behind that argument. So the other isn't really as present. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, I gotta go, guys. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing and being here. And thank then, uh, so we'll move on to Pentecost. Uh, and it's the spirit at work. So those from various racial backgrounds, genders and disabilities are empowered by God. The story is that everyone was speaking in their different languages and um, were understood by others, right? So they weren't forced to give up their culture, their language, all the things that are very colonizing that, that often have, that has happened in our society, right? And in the church, the ways in which you act and move around and navigate in the church are a stripping of who people are a lot of times, all right? You get, you've got to do it this way. Um, and it's usually very white patterns of doing it, very, very uh, ableist patterns. So, um, but the story of Pentecost says, you can come in all of your humanity and with all of the identities and be understood by God and uh, those around us. Um, another thing, when the spirit is at work, both men and women from diverse, uh, diverse backgrounds are energized uh, by spirit to be partners in ministry with God. So it, the partnering part, it really doesn't matter um, the different things that make up our identity. God has called us all to be um, participants and leaders in the work of, of liberation. And then service, the uh, empowerment often produces the desire to advocate for and with and on behalf of others and ourselves, right? So because we have experienced this liberation, 
we want to give it out. That's the commission that even Jesus gives us. You have received this liberation and continuing to be liberated. But while you're doing that, share what you know. Um, yeah. So any thoughts as we, before I move on to the next one? Any conversations in the chat? And the last one I have right now is ordinary time. So this God is at work in the ordinary, right? The, in the everyday of our lives. So advocacy happens in the everyday of our lives. When we're figuring out doing homework and accommodations, when we're figuring out the endless Zoom calls and how to be um, present and how it could be the most accessible, um, decentering space possible, figuring out transportation, et cetera. Those are the ordinary things of advocacy um, and that they are often not the big things of like protest and uh, marches, but, but the everyday ordinary things, um, which is what our faith is as well. When we, we don't often have those like, oh, like God spoke to me moments, it's the everyday ordinary practices so same uh in terms of liberation making calls sharing tips that we've learned um political education etc uh, and then the only other thing i have a prayer that i want to end with but um questions about anything um that you haven't asked or things that i haven't said that you might want to know i'm pretty open so Whatever. Is everybody having trouble with the captions or just some people? No, and I, I was gonna address that here in a little bit. We- um, Sorry, I, I, I shouldn't have said just some people. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't even know what that was, sorry. Um. <laughs> no, uh, I apologize. Our, our captioner had to step off. Um, for the evening, and so we we won't have captioners for the rest of of this um, this session, but we will have it tomorrow and Saturday. So I do apologize about that, but we still have our ASL interpreters for those who need that. Any questions? And if not, we can close. Yep. Yeah. This is Janine. I just wanted to say thank you for the Pentecost as liberation. I never thought about it in quite that way, and I love it. Yeah. Oh, well, I tell you what, Latia, if uh, if it's all right, let's go ahead and break um, everyone off, and we're going to break out into breakout groups. Um, here in a we have here in a second we have four breakout groups that are each going to be uh, about six or seven people each. Um, we don't have uh, assigned questions for you guys to go over. However, in each um, breakout group, I want you all to just discuss um, and digest what you have what you have taken in from uh, from Latia's talk. Um, maybe what uh, what observations you have, insights you have from that, but also how can you put this into practice going forward. Um, uh, and, and how can you put this information to use? Um, I'm, the this breakout times are allotted for about 20 minutes. Um, after that 20 minutes, it will bring you back into the large group. Um, I would ask for each small group, uh, they're going to be led by uh, Lisa McKee, Alyssa, um, Alyssa, Alyssa McNeil, Jonathan uh, Campbell and Corey Herman's Webster are going to lead them. For each of your small groups, maybe assign someone to take notes and, and then someone who, when we come back into the large group, can report back uh, what every group talked about. Uh, and then once we come back, if you have more questions for Latia, we can, we can do that then, okay? Uh, any questions before I break out into those groups? All right, I will... I am putting you in those now. Oh, well, yeah. 
All right, make sure you put on the join your group. Yeah. I'm going to stop sharing because yeah. maybe that's why I didn't get it. Okay. Did you put me in a group? If not, that's cool too. I did not put you in a group. And Becky, Where? I did not put you in a group either uh, because okay. do you want to do it? Should I put you in the group with the I, other interpreter? Muted. Did the other individual sh arrive? They never, they never showed up. Okay, sure. Put me in Helen's group then. That works. Okay. Unless you want me to, yeah, throw me in Helen's group. And if he shows up, yank me out. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. So how do you think that went? It went well. I apologize. I, I was um, I was in and out with my attention because different people were messaging me things and uh, trying to uh, deal with things on the backside. But um, yeah, no but worries. It, it went really well. I and uh, people had a lot of questions. Um, yeah, I felt good about the discussion. How did you feel about it? Yeah, I was like scared that it was just going to be like you no. Know, I was like, come on, we gotta. We're gonna make discussion happen, but it happened, so it was fun. Oh yeah, no, I, I felt like I, I felt like it was good. Uh, I felt like it was really good. Um, um, there was something I was gonna ask you when I, because I knew we were gonna have this time together. But you're okay with asking questions when people come back or answering questions. Yeah. You have any when they come back? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I, I felt like it was good. I guess Paul had to step away. Um, but you feel good? Yeah, it was good. Good conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I enjoyed it. Um, there were a couple that I was like, Ooh, you, you have a lot to say, uh, or you, you got a lot to, to input. So. Yeah. And I wasn't sure about the group. So I was like, I'll, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go light. <laughs> so. Well, there were a couple that joined, um, that joined just joined today that I that I wasn't sure uh I was like oh I hope they're okay with where we go but it is who we are gonna be yeah yeah so hey I'm gonna step away just for a second so I can take a bathroom break yeah and I need to make a phone call so I'll do that I'll meet okay. and I'll be back all right
and I haven't had a job since. And I have like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not even making this number. I have like 25 areas of primary expertise. And um, so, <laughs> uh, so I am, and like everything that ever, that people are complaining about as major issues are, are areas of expertise for me. And so watching, um, watching uh, things burn down uh, as though they're new things uh, and the remote transformation that, you know, I couldn't get basic accommodation for one day a week, not to travel, you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, and now everyone's corporate job is, is remote and, and all of that is, um, is really something to take in. But when COVID happened, uh, I thought, well, I'm a futurist and I'm no fool. And uh, I've got this much money left. It's not 10 years of money and COVID's going to be 10 years. And so what can I do? And, and I started looking at schools again and divinity was one of the first spaces that I looked in, including um, disability theology space. And, and yeah, first off, wow, so white. And also um, the, uh, just the, the ableism within the academy that's just stuck there. And there's just, you know, I, I don't have a solution to that one. I have a lot of solutions, but I don't have one for that. And, and like, uh, you know, I, I put the proposals together and a lot of smart people read them and thought they were great. And then I sent them and the supervisors were having none of it. And um, the, and when I explained, no, I, no, I don't have access to a, um, to online resources. I can't provide you, you know, a 12 page proposal that's heavily cited because COVID is happening and there is no library that's open and there's no way I can buy into um, databases right now and I'm very scrappy and I tried, um, there's no, there's no room, you know, there's no wiggle on that. And, and it's such a white space and it's such a space of uh, no, you know, no professors are trained in dealing with neurodiversity. No, no professors are trained in, in dealing with online, um, anything. And those of us who have, who have been marginalized because we insist on or need to work remotely partially or completely, or have been off ramps because we're caretakers. Um, we can show you all day how to work remotely, right? Like we know how to do it, and um, and we're great at it. But we're the ones who can't have jobs within the institutions um, of, of empire, and and empire seems to pay most of the people. So um, it's yeah, I'm I'm really experiencing that very very heavily, you know, a year in and several proposals in um, by professors who really want me to come to their schools, you know, <laughs> and, and who, and who have disabled kids and, you know, and like who, who live the life even, um, you know, as, as an adjunct, as a, as a disability adjunct and uh, they, but there's still no space. There's still no space. And I mean, you know, my dad's a theologian, so I grew up pretty nerdy and academic like I kind of know the deal and and I can't even crack that nut yeah yeah does anyone have any ideas speaking of that on maybe how we might use the liturgical year ourselves and in in bringing others to see that what we have to say is valid and worth And worth and worth exploring. Hey Tim, can you hear me? No, I can. Hey, sorry, we uh, we have everybody in breakout room breakout rooms. Uh, did you were were you just now able to join the uh, the meeting? Yeah, I. I figured I'd get in on that last half hour and might have to wait a few minutes. Yeah, um, well, if you don't mind, just uh, rather than do you want do you want me to put you in one of the uh, breakout rooms, even though you haven't been a part no. of the discussion, or just want to? No. Okay, I'll uh, yeah, we'll just hang out here and we will. Uh, they have about nine minutes left in their breakout rooms, and then. Um, and then everybody will come back in and we'll start talking some more. So, and Hank, I will, I'm, I was working on the, one of the things I was working on today was the flyer for the, the group I was telling you about. Yeah. So once I get that done, I'll shoot it your way. Yeah. Do you want to bring that up to everybody tonight or? 
I want to wait until I have a, a a physical thing I can say. Here's the thing. So uh, I'm planning on popping in a little bit tomorrow. So okay. Uh, we've had a couple of requests for your slides to be shared. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, I'm okay. I sent them to you in a link. So that okay. link can be uh, like it's open to anyone who has the link. They can okay. view they can view it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure you were you were okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Um I'm trying to think. I feel like there was something else I'm supposed to bring up to the group tonight, but I can't remember. So is it just closing out in a larger discussion based on what was said in the smaller groups? But yeah, based on what was said, we'll uh ask them to to kind of talk about what they shared um, maybe do a q a do you have any final thoughts you want to share no nope, i'm good i mean i'm good yeah. and then uh, we'll jonathan and i will just close up talk about what to expect with the rest of the conference okay. um yeah and then close up from there so um yeah there's one of our, so I guess two people had to leave because one of our breakout rooms is down to only four people and the rest have seven. Mm. Do you mind if I put you in that room real quick? Yeah, I'm good. Hey, Joy. Mickle tried to call earlier. Will you call him back?
Everybody is popping back into screen. Everybody's slowly coming back. We actually had an extra minute, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, then there was a one minute of redemption. So. <laughs> Was well, it give you time to wrap anything up that you you might needed uh, you might need to talk about? Most appropriate. Yeah. Uh, looks like everybody is slowly slowly coming back. Uh, once, want to make sure Latia is back in. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> It's good to see you after such a long time. It has been a long time. It's nice to see you too. Hope th I hope that you're doing well. All right. I believe everyone is back, um, back from our groups. So uh, I just want to, as I said, I want to go to each group and um, and ask you to report back what you all discussed. Uh, what were your takeaways? and uh and what could we use going forward um and as well if you have any questions for latia um the group that corey led uh i'm not sure who all was in your group but uh corey did uh do you have someone who wants to speak for your group or or is that you Uh, I cannot claim to speak for the group, but I did take notes for the group. And, and who, who is speaking? I'm sorry, I, I was trying to find your square. Okay, now I see you. Hi, it's Ophelia Hukini. She, her, hers are my pronouns. Um, if any, if I've left something important off of these notes, I hope that one of my group mates will jump in and save me. Mm -hmm. We talked about how we too often don't talk about the importance of race in the disability community. Um, there were a number of people in our, in our group who were struck by the beauty of the liturgical calendar and how solidarity is already embedded in each of these seasons. Um, we also talked about, well, we asked about what lay people could do to introduce transformative, transformative ideas and power to our congregations. So a member of our group was um, unfortunately kicked out of church leadership and is you know, now a lay person wondering how they can um, introduce powerful and transformative ways of thinking about um, the disabled God in church when they no longer reside in a position of power at church. And so our group members talked a lot about different ways in which um, we could um, decenter whoever is in the center and center those on the margins um, in ways that don't necessarily outright rock the boat, but um, give voice and, and time and space. Are there any other thoughts on that, that question that they, that they lifted up in their group? All right. Um, is there anything else, Ophelia, from your group that y'all want to share? No, I think that was it. It was a really enjoyable time. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, Jonathan, what about your group? Uh, Brian was kind enough to uh, volunteer to speak for our group, so I'll turn that over to him. I got a bit... For me, first off, I had to say that it's been decades since I've been to seminary, and so BIPOC was a new term for me, Black, Indigenous, Colored, Black, Indigenous, People of Color. I appreciate learning a new term tonight. Thank you all. Um, some of us find that we don't preach about disability and its concerns for a lot, of, a lot of different reasons, and the liturgical calendar helped us think it through and say, this does matter. This does connect in, and we can bring us home, and the other challenge is some of us, and I, I'll include myself, is very much like to hide our disabilities because we want to pass as normal. Mm -hmm. We want the church to get past our own struggles and see us as somebody else. And we realize that's not good. It doesn't help one bit with liberation or advocacy. 
And we realized that's a, a huge fault. Yeah. Um, Bill Do- Docker is part of our group and he was sharing that he has a daughter who they've, who is African-American and disabled. And they said, even in Knoxville, Tennessee, they were concerned with the racism, but really it's daily they fight the disabilities. Mm-hmm. That's been a daily battle everywhere they've gone. And it's not the racism, it's the, it's the disability has been the major issue. The racism has added other issues, but that's the, the disability is a bigger issue. Yeah. And you know, Brian, as you're speaking, one of the things that, that came to my mind is you talk about um, this, um, uh, th- this tendency within disability culture that for a lot of us, we try to pass on a, on a regular basis or try to look normal. Um, and, and something that I think can be done within the church and within disability communities overall is uh, we, we have to do much more mentoring of youth with disabilities that it's okay to be disabled. I, I, there's not enough of that that takes place. Um, most of the time, I, thinking of myself when I was a teenager with a disability and who spent most of my time trying to pretend like I didn't have a disability, it was because um, everything that surround all the narratives surrounding disability was about a need to overcome, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's this need to overcome my disability so that I can function within society. Um, and, and we need, we, I think as a group within this group, but within church groups overall need to work with youth who are disabled and let them know it's okay to be disabled, that this is, mm-hmm. This is one of the many varieties of being human that are out there, um, and it's a it's a blessed blessed divine reality to live within. Um, uh, and and, and I, I think we need to work harder at that, um, so that because I, I mean we all know there's so much that's wrapped into that with self esteem and um, uh, within you know uh, living into who who you're called to be and all that so. Um, go ahead, Lisa. Uh, somebody had asked me um, in the chat uh, about my comment about um, uh, my um, when I use the term um, around ableism, self. Um, what did I say? Self ableism, and like. Oh, I was raised, I was raised to be ableist mm-hmm. in that disability was not seen as a normal thing. And like you were talking about overcoming. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, I'm not so sure that we have to work at it, um, it more than we have to live with their own skin, kind of like Latia was talking. That we have to bring it into into um, okayness with ourselves and as we mentor kids with disabilities that will just come through right i'm not sure that it's something that we can work on we have to be well i i when i say work on i i don't i think we have to be intentional in telling people it's okay to be disabled right right um and because I don't think that's done enough. Like, mm. there's still that feeling. You know, most of us talk about reclaiming that term disabled so that it's no longer a bad term, that it's something you can be proud of within your life. And, and I think. Right. 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 Um, Lisa, Lisa, you, uh, what, what, about, what about your group? I railroaded wrote, wrote Sharon McCart because I forgot to ask who wanted to do it. So Sharon is going to speak for our group. 
Karen, we turn uh, unmute yourself. There, there you go. we go. I'm sorry, the button didn't. It was kind of, I don't know, didn't work. Okay, um, I'll do the best I can. I didn't really take good notes preparing to do this. Um, so yeah, our group kind of walked through the liturgical year. Um, we had comments made about ordinary time and how we hadn't thought of it quite that way before is just finding God in the ordinary of our lives. Um, but also about other pieces of it. Um, so and then we had a, a really long discussion about uh, the Eucharist, um, Holy Communion, and solidarity, which both Lisa and I really latched onto, um, but also about other uh, pieces of that and how did the church, how did the standard architecture for churches become so inaccessible? Um, how did it become so difficult for people with disabilities to serve or receive communion um, without moving the communion table maybe down to the floor or somewhere else? And it just, you know, how did, how did that all start? Um, and I'm not sure, we didn't come to any uh, conclusion about that, but just that it, it's part of our church history that we need to think about, I think. Um, I mean, who decided that everything has to be up, you know, a half a flight of stairs. Um, and I wrote down in my notes, I'm not sure it was said, but what does it say about the sacrament when it's inaccessible either to serve or to partake? And that's, it's, you know, there's a lot of things exclusionary about about the sacrament as far as who can serve and who can do this and who can do that. Um, and it's all wrapped up in that. It's um, definitely uh, some kind of hierarchy going on. It helped at least in uh, one church about the accessibility that communion is not has never been more accessible than it is right now. In, and because now we have the little cups again and we have wafers or we have little pieces of bread and, and instead of you know having to dip and all that, it's a lot more accessible to just have it all put in your hand. Yeah. Um, so if anybody else in the group wants to chime in, please, please do because <laughs> cause I'm out, I'm done. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, if anybody, else, uh, that, other, that group, if you want to continue to think about it, but we'll go ahead and, and move forward to uh, Alyssa's group. Um, what, all, what all was shared in yours? I think, if you don't mind, this is the interpreter. I think our um, pictures got moved a bit. We're just going to take a moment to switch interpreters if you just yeah. uh, don't mind. I was trying to get her attention, but I think the picture shifted when we came back as a large group. So I appreciate your No, thank you for, thank you for. Thank you. Give everybody just a moment to pin the new interpreter. Okay. Thank you. Are we, are we ready? Can we? Okay. Okay. Um, Alyssa, what about your group? <clears throat> All right. In our group, we talked about the boldness of the liturgical year and kind of in a way and that it in many ways is, is, is an accessible tool and it kind of opens the door for everyone to be able to participate versus the way that we traditionally were, had, been, had been doing church. Um, we also talked about a little bit about how does with the question does theological education as we know it is it setting us back mm. okay um if anyone else wants to chime in for my group that would be great i was kind of trying to lead and scribble down notes i know i'm sorry we got we got into it so fast we we, we forgot about the notes um yeah. I took a few notes, uh, but something that I thought of um, as we were just getting done and talking through like, what's, is there a way to, uh, you know, how, how, how do we do Zoom? Like if we, 
if there were several of us in, in our group that are are all about the Zoom and uh, you know, don't forget me when you go back to your real church. Um, something that I thought of uh, at the end was just decentering membership as a value mm. um, for me theologically is is really important. Um, and I, I've seen so much damage done by this um, marry me and then let's go on a date, uh, become a member and then I'll let you onto my committee. Um, and as a, as a lay person and as an organizational designer, who's a pastor's kid, like I do organizational design because I know that the devil and the redemption live in the details of how we process, how we do process. And so I am, uh, I, I, I was, I was talked into one more time joining a church, um, uh, so that I could be on teams and serve immediately. And, and I will never do it again. It was, um, it was immediately clear that that was not going to be fruitful and, uh, and that it was not the right thing. And there was no way to find that out without becoming a member. And, um, it's, and it's abusive and it's patriarchal and imperialist and, and, um, in, in my lens of it. And so decentering membership is, is one way to really flatten that space, whether you have like a really tiny church, like I'm in where it's pretty easy to keep things flat as long as people are down with that. Um, but even in a, in a bigger community where some of the group was talking about like, um, you know, issues with, well, we have this big church now we're kind of, uh, the group didn't say this, but like, you know, some churches are kind of unwieldy yeah. online. It's still the same people talking that we're talking in the pulpit, but like, there's not a flatness of sharing and participation. And for, for me, uh, membership is, um, uh, removing membership as a requirement to really participate meaningfully and in what one feels called to do um, is really key. So y'all just made me think of that at the very end. I'm sorry I didn't like, and I had to take my call and I got off the phone. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> You're fine. Um, thank you all for sharing. Um, real quick, we may have just two or three minutes. Does anybody have a quick question for Latia that, that didn't get answered before? I would like to say thank you for a wonderful presentation. It was, it was very helpful. It was very good, yes. Absolutely. I told okay. Latia, I, I hope she one day turns that presentation into a book with the, uh, with the uh, liturgical seasons. I think that would be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for letting me come and I'll, I'll pop in on other things as, as the conference continues. Yeah. Latia, I... I this is Lacey here. I'd love to be in contact with you because I've been working on a D-man um, in disability in the church and my area is going to be spiritual formation. Is it possible that I contact you later? Yeah, Hank has my email so um, he can share that as well. Yeah, if anybody would um, if anybody would like uh, Latia's email. You can send me a message. Latia has also uh, been kind enough to um, uh, allow us to share her slides with you all. So at the end of the conference, we will, uh, uh, Corey is working on putting those together in a document um, with all the, any other information that we might have from, um, from this weekend. And, uh, and we will make sure that uh, we send those out to everyone. Um, yeah, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, just to let you know, as we move forward, um, do a quick outline. So we will we will gather back again tomorrow uh, morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Um, I in our original schedule, I forgot to let everybody know that that is Eastern time. So. Um, so make sure you make that change in your head wherever you're located in the country. Um, we will begin with a worship service from Bishop Peggy Johnson, who has kind of been our resident bishop for the Association of Ministers with Disabilities, as well as the Disability Ministries Committee. Bishop Johnson is kind of um, just the disability saint of the United Methodist Church. Uh, she yeah. is 
she is all over the place uh, and, and been a, a voice for us uh, for a long time. So, um, so we are excited that she will be uh, sharing worship with us in the morning. Uh, after that, we will have Kendrick Kemp um, uh, and Russell Ewell. Russell will be uh, moderating a discussion with Kendrick. Um, you will have seen that uh, Kendrick um, will be talking about uh, liberation theology of disability, um, uh, something he is very proud of and has been working on. And, um, and Russell, who uh, is a good friend of mine out of Missouri, he will be uh, have a lot to say in that discussion also, as well. So uh, I'm excited about that. And then we will have another group of uh, small groups and then uh, close tomorrow with uh, uh, just insights and questions that we might have had. Um, several of you have asked uh, about Saturday. Saturday is a business meeting for, um, for our group, the Association of Ministers with Disabilities. Of course, everyone here is welcome to join uh, that meeting. Um, you don't have to be a member uh, to be a part of that meeting. Just know that we will be doing dealing with organizational meeting stuff. So we will be doing exciting stuff like voting on bylaws and uh, uh, deciding officers and and looking at our way forward. So um, if, uh, but we all are, well, as I said, all are welcome if you're interested in, in what the work of Association of Ministers with Disabilities are. Hank. But I, I, I heard that there was three food that was going to be passed out. <laughs> there is, uh, yeah. Life is full of disappointment. You can watch as I, as I pass it around to myself. Yes. <laughs> Feel free yeah. to bring your own food and eat it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I so, just, I just ahead, got my go. girls. I just got my shipment of Girl Scout cookies, so I can bring those. Jealous. Uh, we have not gotten ours yet. So, uh, jealous. yeah. But, uh, but anyone who wants to join us for that meeting, you're welcome. Um, those of you, many of you ha are members of AMD, so I look forward to uh, you all joining us. Um, yeah, are there any other questions you all have for us tonight? Question on um, in our small group, Alyssa, did you were those your questions or Latia were those yours or Hank? Did, they were who, kind of I kind those? of made made up questions as as I was listening. No kidding. Me, and so I was like, let me. No, okay. Well, y'all other groups, I'm sure you had good questions, but like you missed out because like these, no, I would have never guessed that those were like on the fly because those were some of the most brilliant questions I've ever heard and like so. Just good so many ways. Good so many ways. So well, thanks. I appreciate Shout out it. for the questions. Yeah. And uh, just real quick, I'm looking at the, the chat. Uh, worship begins tomorrow at 10 a.m. 